Yeah, so here we're going to compile uh, Zeppelin from source and walk through the tutorial notebook that comes with it. So first I specify the location where the Spark it has been uh, unzipped. Um, I'm going to now unzip the data that I've downloaded for Zeppelin source code. And I will go into that folder and run my maven clean install command. Note that I'm specifying the Spark 1.3 option to match the binary version of Spark that I've downloaded. Let's take a little while to run. It's worth noting here that Zeppelin does come with a version of Spark uh, in its distribution, but for a couple of reasons I'm using Spark 1.3 uh, in, in another project, so I want to build off the same version. That's why I specified at the, at the build command line there. And there's the final report, a total build time of 2 minutes and 41 seconds. From here, we can run the Zeppelin daemon start command. It'll give you a little message there to say that it's creating a log folder and a run folder. And this is what kind of every install comes with out of the box. Um, you can go to your, you can see your list of interpreters that are defined. You'll see my spark home variable came across. So it's pointing to where Spark was installed. Uh, it's got Markdown, Angular, uh, Shell Script, and Hive and Tajo installed. Um, so I can type in using these um, little kind of shebang uh, header remarks in my code to tell it which interpreter to use behind the scenes. So you'll see these uh, in the code. Now by default, it'll try to use the Spark ones. Um, so if you want to use Markdown, you use MD, and I'll show you later how to uh, set up Python. So let's go to the back to the main screen. There's the, the Zeppelin tutorial. Now it'll ask you um, what bindings to use for the, or which interpreters are going to be used. We'll just leave them all in there. So a uh, quick run around the kind of uh, UI here. We can um, actually hide uh, the code. We can hide the results. And we can hide both, and it will just show a title if one's been defined. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to collapse all of this just to make everything neat and tidy for a minute. So we can walk through each step one by one. You'll notice the, uh, the actual boxes are interactive. So you can type code into the top of the box and the results will show in the bottom of the box. So that's not editable, but this is. Type your code in the top, hit play or shift enter, and then it runs and shows your results in the bottom or gives you a status output or, or whatever your code will do. So you notice that I defined it as, it's been defined as markdown. I provide the markdown code. The results are shown below. Great. So that's a Markdown example. You can go through, and if you know Markdown, you can you can um, put in your pull it put in your different code that you're used to to using here. Um, uh, any other formatting that you're familiar with? Oops, etc.
So you could actually preview, build your document, preview it down here, copy and paste it into GitHub or whatever into other documents. So aside from using Spark, which we're going to focus on in the tutorial, aside from using Spark, you can use it for these other interpreters and it gives you an interactive environment to do so. It's really cool. So let's get rid of that and go to the data preparation phase. Now, the neat thing here is that, remember, it, <clears throat> uh, we, we actually have access to the underlying system here uh, using this uh, Scala uh, command. We can actually access uh, the wget tool. So you have to make sure you have that installed. I'm on OS X, and I just run the brew install wget, and that gives me access to it. So you could go and you could manually run this wget command, save the file, create it, uh, but this one will do it automatically for you, this little script. So it'll create a folder, it'll unzip the, fold, the data into that folder, and delete the archive. I'm going to run this because it takes uh, a minute to download. So what's doing is grabbing a zip file. It's going to plop it into the, the root folder of the installation. So let's go back and we'll just see. And it creates the data folder now and has extracted the data into that folder. Now, before we go any further, I want to look at some of that data. Let's look at uh, the main data of the file that we're going to use is called bank full. You'll see it's got a header. It's got like 17 fields, a couple of numeric ones, and the rest are just text. So the main ones that I'll be looking at in the tutorial are age, uh, job, marital status, education, and balance. I assume that's a bank balance, something like that. So now that data has been extracted and is available to the Spark SQL interpreter, which we're going to look at next. Loading data into the table is as simple as creating an overriding kind of a, a SQL context object. We then do a couple, an environmental variable here to point to where the data file is going to come from. No big deal. Then we create a bank object class here that uh, has the schema defined that we want. So note we've only included five columns here when there's more like, there's like 12 more in the data file. And then in the next step, we actually will go through and parse out the the data. So as part of this filter, we check to make sure that the first uh, object in the array in this point, at this point, because uh, the, the text has been split into an array, um, the first one is not does not have the word age in it. And if you remember our uh, looking at the raw data, the, uh, the header line has the word age in it. So it's basically just saying, let's skip that, that row. But for all the other rows, you use the index number, the, the first, second, third, and, uh, fourth, and sixth columns get mapped to basically into their uh, own bank class uh, property. You'll see there's some type conversion here. So this takes the age, converts it to integer. This takes the, what's the next one? The uh, job position. And it replaces the, the quotes that are in it. These gets rid of these quotes. And then handles it as a string internally in Spark. And then we create a, a data frame, a Spark a SQL data frame. And we register that data as um, a table with the name bank. So now we can use that name in a Spark SQL statement uh, throughout the rest of the tutorial. So let's run this. Again, just note that the first time you run some of these interpreters, they take uh, five or 10 seconds to start. Um, after that, they'll run a lot faster. So we're loading the CSV file, parsing it out, um, loading it into uh, Spark SQL, and we didn't get any errors back. And you can see the output here. Every time we define uh, a variable, we get output showing that it was actually instantiated. So that's the second step, loaded data into the table. Now we can actually interact with it without having to do much more. So we can, at this point, use SQL to query that RDD, or that data set that's been created. And if we were running in a distributed mode, that uh, RDD would be, or that data table would be spread across the, the machines in our cluster 
um, and we can query it here with SQL in one interface. So we're going to uh, select the age. We're going to count how many entities of each age there are and apply a filter or a where clause and the results will be a chart. Let's just run this again just to show you that it is running in real time here. So again, it takes a second or two, four seconds to run the first time. Um, and then from then on, it's pretty much dynamic. So if I change that to the age less than 80 and I run it, you'll see it's pretty much instantaneous. Or we can get rid of the where clause altogether, for example. So that's, that's a real basic query there. Now this other query here is what they call dynamic forms. So you can actually specify a, a variable or a column name here and specify it as a variable and it will create a dynamic box here. Looks like they've got some formatting issues. But max age equals 30. You can actually punch that into the box here and run it and it will dynamically update the chart. This becomes important for when you go to share the share the project with other people, you can actually create dynamic forms. I'll go more into that in another episode. The other thing I wanted to show here was this other one where you can actually dynamically create a drop-down box or a, a select list to choose from. And you notice we don't actually have to resubmit this or rerun it. It uh, will do it automatically when a value is changed. One other thing I want to show here is that we have actually the ability to add in multiple other columns. So one's called job and one's called marital. I'll type in job here. We'll group by age and job. And now we will actually have um, a second variable here. We'll go to settings and you can see that we have um, groups that we can provide in here. And these groups basically will translate into series. So if I take job and drag it in there, now I can see all my results. Oh, they're a real mess. Let me just let me just do a different one. Uh, marital. Marital is a little easier because there's only a couple classes in it. Drag marital down into groups. And now we'll see Oh, they put the value in the wrong spot. Now we'll see the broken down into those groups. You start to see how this can become really, really a powerful tool, especially for doing scatter plot stuff. But I'll pull up another example at another time. But I just wanted to show you the basics of working with the these these charting UIs, um, running through the tutorial to uh, prep data, make basically run system calls, and then get that data loaded into Spark SQL ready to go. So this is going to be a very common work workflow here. This example of loading data into a table. Take a CSV file um, from a text file or from HDFS or from some other source. Pull it in, parse it out, load it into a table, and then interact with it with SQL. Uh, very powerful. And you know we've taken maybe 10, 15 minutes here and got it all up and running from compilation to loading uh, the tutorial data set and running through the tutorial steps. And that's it. Congratulations. It's done. So let me know in, your co in the comments on the video or on my blog uh, if you'd like to see something specific about Zeppelin. Uh, I'll be digging more into using it with Spark SQL and probably also with the Python interpreter uh, calling Spark as well. Eventually, hopefully, getting into some graphics as well so we can do some network graph analysis. Thanks for watching.